value systems of Plato, St. Paul, Andrus. That's me. I am Andrus Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. And this is the third in a series of videos about the meaning of life, which is harmony, and expressing that through the cognitive frameworks of the language of wondrous wisdom, which is a language of wisdom, a language for uh, relating everything that we could be possibly know about our different points of view, speaking a shared and common language. So I'll be explaining um, the ways that uh, the same cognitive frameworks arise in these different uh, thinkers, um, but as permutations. And so they're permuting with regard to this three cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting. It's a learning cycle, can go round and round. And they're structured according to four levels of knowledge, uh, whether, what, how, why. And so this is an intertwining. So if you've watched the first two episodes, you'll have a sense of that. Uh, if not, then hang on, maybe you'll get it. So we'll start with uh, Plato. And he has a value system uh, where there is um, obeying what he called temperance, let's say. There's courage, there's uh, wisdom, which relates to beauty. And it all is in the support of justice. And so uh, this is the third part. Um, it's uh, about uh, intertwining the threesome and the foursome. And this is how I came to um, think about the meaning of life by noticing uh, this tricky, sophisticated way how these structures are trying to come together, try to make sense of them. And then uh, inspired a bit by a friend, uh, Gilvenas Belauskas. This was in Soviet-occupied Lithuania. I was there for a year from 1988 to 1989, the year before the Berlin Well fell at the University of Vilnius. And uh, I thought, oh, this that I've stumbled upon, uh, I think it says the meaning of life. I have decided to break up this section into three videos so that I don't talk for too long at a time. And in this video, I'm reading excerpts from Plato's Republic that are related to his four levels of knowledge and the four values, or he would say virtues, of the city and its inhabitants. So we'll start with the Plato's Republic, uh, a book that he wrote uh, about 500 BC or so in ancient Greece. So it's time to put on my helmet. Um, and we're going to talk about this republic. Now, this is an imaginary uh, republic. Uh, back in ancient Greece, people lived in polises, which were like city-states, a bit like megalopolises today, uh, except that with uh, you know fewer people, maybe you'd have 100,000 people you know, in the whole city and countryside. And uh, a great example would be Athens, which is where Socrates lived. And Plato is uh, describing a di dialogue um, that Socrates has regarding justice. Is it better to be just or just to seem just? So these questions of being and seeming and the questions of defining justice. And so the whole strategy of the book is to say, well, let's invent a microscope, which they did not have back then, but let's take a person and make them bigger. Let's consider them as if they were a city. And let's consider the perfect city. Let's build the perfect city from scratch. And this city ended up having a caste system, three different castes, uh, which, you know, uh, the city itself uh, had very many radical things, such as, you know, that women and men should be warriors, uh, things that back in the day just seemed absolutely ridiculous, right? Uh, but which... <laughs> Well, which uh, have not, like, if if you consider, um, well, like the problems with democracy that we're facing now, they're all described in uh, Plato's Republic. Um, and one thing um, that I did not realize at the time, I encountered this book uh, in a class uh, as a freshman. I was 17. It was the first quarter. And the, 
The series was called Political Order and Change, part of the Common Core at the University of Chicago. And so we were reading the classics of uh, political philosophy. This is certainly maybe one of the very first. And I've read it four times. You know, I've actually taught from it uh, when I taught philosophy at the uh, Vilnius Gediminas Technical University. It's a great classic. I highly recommend it. Uh, but only recently, uh, I've been uh, thinking in terms of a triple mind, you know, that we have an unconscious that is uh, given by, let's say, 100 billion neurons. It averages it all up. It gives the one right answer. It can't explain how it got it. It's very much like chat GPT. It's a drivel machine, you know, um, just nonsense that it's spouting out, but that's useful nonsense. Then we have another uh, mind, uh, like another hemisphere of the brain, you could say, which I call the conscious, which is organizing a conceptual language of perhaps a hundred thousand concepts, right? But the crucial thing uh, that relates these two hemispheres, or you could say uh, champions uh, of these hemispheres, um, there's a mind that knows, there's a mind that does not know, and there's a consciousness that uh, uh, relates them so that they're saying the same thing. And the way it seems to function is that um, the unconscious is um, saying something's not right, something needs to be modeled, something is not um, is not getting attention. And so then the conscious is adapting, expanding, updating its model. But the consciousness is holding a break. It's saying, wait, 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 wait. And when I tell you everything is fine, then we'll hardwire it, okay? And I was recently at a talk uh, on um, the mathematics of consciousness, uh, and there's a huge team of 30, 40 people in France, and uh, so they're studying how people do tasks, and there's certain tasks that you do before you're even able to be conscious, so it's, I think, like from zero to 300 milliseconds, but then afterwards, uh, you can consciously uh, be aware and the consciousness kicks in, you know, more of your brain kicks in. But those unconscious uh, behaviors continue, which is interesting. So you get this kind of like uh, what they call, a, uh, it was unimodal first, but then it becomes like a bifunctorial, I think they were calling it, a, a bifuncular maybe. And so uh, you get two different uh, worlds, so to speak. So they're using this thing, there's a global workspace, but there's also a global playground of the unconscious. And so what I think is happening here, that's an indicator that the consciousness is this third mind that's holding the break. It's saying, I want you to both function until you can sort out, you know, and I'll tell you when to um, hardwire uh, the answer. So that type of charitable mind, it's, it's very much uh, what Plato is talking about. So when he's talking about, though, this city, he's examining a single person as if they were a whole city with different castes. And so he's saying there's these three castes, and they would um, concur with uh, these three minds that I was saying. So there's, uh, first of all, the craftsmen, the, the peasants, you know, the ordinary, us ordinary people. And so we represent the passions and the appetites. You know, we want to just, cons we're consumers, as is called, right? And so we can get out of control if the passions and the appetites get out of control. You know, they need to be put in their place. That's a classical type of way of looking at uh, the problems of morality. And so then he's saying, well, there's a warrior class. They're spirited. You know, they're daring. They're brave. They're fearless. Uh, they're kind of bullies, let's say. So that's what the conscious is like. They're going to bully everything into, they're going to corral everything, put it into shape. So that's what we do with questions. It's a language of questions, which are like a language of empty slots, a language of corrals. And we're going to corral all these appetites uh, so that uh, they don't master us, but we master them. But what keeps the bullies in control? So then there's these rulers who use a rationality, proportionality, and to make sure that the, the questions and the answers are in right proportion. You know, that the force used and, you know, the... Uh, the uh, passions, um, let's say that they're, they're, they're proportional, everything is working out. So this is, uh, and the question is, where is justice located? And basically the answer will be um, harmony, which um, I'm learning is the meaning of life. So we're going to look at this in two different ways, um, because we have the foursome for knowledge, and then we have the threesome, the three cycle for learning. So 
we're going to look at uh, levels of knowledge in Plato's Republic. And he's really into this. And this is where I picked the foursome from. So nowadays I talk about four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. But when I started, I was just realizing there are these things, I think divisions of everything. I think there are these things where when you're trying to, you know, of course, if you have complicated things, you can define them in terms of simpler ones. But how do you define the simplest things? You have to define them in terms of each other. You can't define them in terms of words. You have to define them in terms of structural relationships. And these have to be holistic frameworks. So that's where mine was, my mind was, and that's where Plato's mind, uh, I think you'll see, is also. And so then I picked that up and I, in the beginning, I used his terminology, but then I said, you know, like, how do we talk about these things in our daily life? We use very basic words, so whether, what, how, why. And so we'll, we'll be uh, talking about that distinction. Whether being the most narrow knowledge of uh, things that, uh, in a certain sense, aren't even, uh, aren't even um, accessible or real, and why being this divine total knowledge, and what and how being this intermediary uh, knowledge, uh, he'll call that opinion, but like what being the sensory knowledge that's coming into us and how being this practical fun functional knowledge, how to make and create things, how to use them. So let me read from Plato's Republic. Um, this is a dialogue, uh, Socrates is uh, speaking. Socrates was Plato's teacher and he's speaking to one of his uh, friends or students. And are we assured after looking at the matter from many points of view, that absolute being is or may be absolutely known, but that the utterly non-existent is utterly unknown. Nothing can be more certain. Good. But if there be anything which is of such a nature as to be and not to be, that will have a place intermediate between pure being and the absolute negation of being. Yes, between them. And as knowledge corresponded to being and ignorance of necessity to not being, for that intermediate between being and not being, there has to be discovered a corresponding intermediate between ignorance and knowledge, if there be such. Certainly. Do we admit the existence of opinion? Undoubtedly. As being the same with knowledge or another faculty? another faculty, then opinion and knowledge have to do with different kinds of matter corresponding to this difference of faculties. Yes. So see, you know, it's, and this is 2,500 years ago, you know, but it's uh, just absolutely kind of fascinating uh, how, you know, teacher is leading student and just the whole, there's many levels on which to, to be oh, oh, amazed about this. But what I want to emphasize, though, is that he's pointing out two extremes. So on the left here, we see absolute knowledge of absolute being and utter ignorance of the utterly non-existent. And he's opening up this space for opinion, which will be in between. And uh, the whole point of his theory is that uh, maybe it's not very interesting if there's nothing in between. You know, what makes it interesting is that these intermediary levels and then how they relate to the absolute levels. Likewise, you know, the intermediary levels wouldn't be so interesting if they couldn't relate to the absolute levels. So the absolute and the relative, how are they related? And he's also uh, trying to bridge, you know, knowledge and being. You see, and how are those two worlds related? Which I would suppose can go back to this being doing thinking, right? So the three cycle of uh, taking a stand, falling through, reflecting. So it's all getting set up here. And uh, just to say that uh, this is uh, the beginnings of philosophy, but this grappling between we have words, we need to understand what our words mean, but that there's a reality beyond the words. So we're working with words, we're looking for opposites, we're looking for structural relations, but then we're trying to say that really words are just referring to something deeper and really more real. And we're trying to speak to that uh, deeper reality. Whereas modern uh, philosophy, at least a good half of it, let's say the analytic philosophy, is just saying it's all about words. You see, it's just about uh, if we just understood our words better, uh, we wouldn't have these philosophical problems. You know, we're just abusing words. That's why we're getting these problems. 
But classically, it's the exact opposite. It's saying, how do we think without words? And so if you want to master wondrous wisdom, you should think about this as like learning to think without words, thinking in terms of structures. So here's a bit more about these levels of knowledge. Your Socrates saying. Then, if being is the subject matter of knowledge, something else must be the subject matter of opinion. Yes, something else. Well then, is not being the subject matter of opinion? Or rather, how can there be an opinion at all about not being? Reflect. When a man has an opinion, has he not an opinion about something? Can he have an opinion which is an opinion about nothing? Impossible. He who has an opinion has an opinion about some one thing. Yes. And not being is not one thing, but properly speaking, nothing. True. Of not being, ignorance was assumed to be the necessary correlative. Of being, knowledge. True, he said. Then opinion is not concerned either with being or with not being. Not with either. And can therefore neither be ignorance nor knowledge. That seems to be true. So this is saying more of the same. But the crucial thing I want to point out is this idea of like opinion being about some one thing. Okay. And so, and also, you know, when I was learning about this, it's hard to figure out like what to pick up on. Uh, so I'm telling you because I've gone for decades on this and now I'm returning to this uh, maybe a fifth time, you know, pleasure in picking up new things, kind of like reading the Bible. Or, um, so the point being that uh, when we have these levels of knowledge, um, it's what are they knowledge of? What is the scope? And I'm claiming that the scope could be everything, anything, something, nothing. So for these absolute things, like if you know being, you know, in a sense, you know everything, you know the whole of it, right? If you know, if you're ignorant, uh, you know nothing, and it's about not being, right? But basically, you, you, your knowledge has become absolutely reduced to zero scope, uh, zero knowledge, zero nothing. But there are intermediary scopes. So he's saying if it's not knowledge of one thing, it's knowledge of something. Okay. Or it could be knowledge of anything. So what I call knowledge of something, I would say that's what? Your sensory knowledge about something. But knowledge of anything would be knowledge of how. Like, you know, that you're, instead of having things, you have like a whole you have a canvas for that hole. You have a hole cut out of your canvas, your backdrop, and you're able to look at the world a certain way, and you're able to use that slot as a question to deal with all your answers. So you have this algorithmic language of questioning, which allows you to get things done with some arbitrary thing you'll put in there. So that's knowledge of anything. You know, you put whatever you want in there, I'll be able to function with it. I'll be able to deal with it because I have the right, let's say, canvas. I have the language of, I have the right hole in the canvas. I have the right, right to backdrop for that. So it's like an opposite way of thinking. So I'll try to give some evidence for that. But right now, all he's saying is that there's these extremes or something in the middle. So, and now this will be more clear, like when we talk about um, these various values of these various casts, um, and um, he ranks them according to these levels of knowledge. So there's a higher caste, you know, than the next caste and the lower caste. And then he'll talk about the value of the whole thing. So, Often uh, they'll be using the words virtues. I'll reserve that word for more of a technical meaning. Um, uh, and so with regard to like courage and then later uh, hope and uh, honesty. But that's, uh, that's my technical prerogative. So let's think about wisdom. And these are the people who have the total knowledge. They're the philosopher kings, right? They've been completely trained and they've been um, good at receiving that training. And the kinds of knowledge in a state are many and diverse, of course. There is the knowledge of the carpenter. But is that the sort of knowledge which gives a city the title of wise and good in counsel? Certainly not. That would only give a city the reputation of skill in carpentering. Then a city is not to be called wise because possessing a knowledge which counsels for the best about wooden implements. Certainly not. Nor by reason of a knowledge which advises about 
brazen pots, I said, nor as possessing any other similar knowledge. Not by reason of any of them, he said. Nor yet by reason of a knowledge which cultivates the earth. That would give the city the name of agricultural. Yes. Well, I said, and is there any knowledge in our recently founded state among any of the citizens which advises not about any particular thing in the state, but about the whole, and considers how a state can best deal with itself and with other states? There certainly is. And what is this knowledge? Among whom is it found? I asked. It is the knowledge of the guardians, he replied, and is found among those who we were just now describing as perfect guardians. So here, uh, this is following several chapters about the education of these guardians, you know, finding children who are very adept uh, at the learning and who are very adept at uh, not um, chasing after pleasures, uh, not fearing pain, but uh, having a love of knowledge and truth and, and uh, spiritual beauty. And so, and of course, they're all taken away from their families and no one knows who their real parents are. And so all these types of uh, uh, things that uh, now are, of course, again, are becoming uh, related with advances in biotechnology and such. But so this was all imagined back in the day by Plato and Socrates. And so the reason I wanted to read this is to talk about the knowledge of the whole you know, he's putting in context. I could just say that philosophically, you see, but he makes that more vivid. What is he talking about? And if we think about the history of the time, you know, and I'm kind of like imagining and, and, and filling in uh, the gaps as does our friend G Chat GPT. But I can think of uh, different polices, you know, they were um, known, renowned, kind of like cities today, you know, for being the capital of uh, cucumbers, let's say, or, you know, the capital olive oil was a huge, uh, huge uh, product uh, back in the day that would be traded across the Mediterranean Sea. That was uh, many uses of olive oil, but um, I think Athens was related to olive oil. So you could say, well, our city is based on olive oil, just like Detroit is based on the automobile. You know, every city has its uh, skills and its resources. Uh, but he's saying that's not what makes a city wise. Now, courage, okay? I mean that courage is a kind of adherence. Adherence to what? To the opinion respecting things to be feared, what they are and of what nature, which the law implants through education. And I mean by the words, under all circumstances, to intimate that in pleasure or in pain, or under the influence of desire or fear, a man preserves and does not lose this opinion. Shall I give you an illustration? If you please. You know, I said that dyers, when they want to dye wool for making the true sea purple, begin by selecting their white color first. This they prepare and dress with much care and pains in order that the white ground may take the purple hue in full perfection. The dyeing then proceeds, and whatever is dyed in this matter becomes a fast color, and no washing, either with lies or without them, can take away the bloom. But when the ground has not been duly prepared, you will have noticed how poor is the look, either of purple or of any other color. Yes, he said, I know that they have a washed out and ridiculous appearance. Then now, I said, you will understand what our object was in selecting our soldiers and educating them in music and gymnastic. We were contriving influences which would prepare them to take the dye of the laws in perfection. And the color of their opinion about dangers and of every other opinion was to be indelibly fixed by their nurture and training not to be washed away by such potent lies as pleasure, mightier agent for in washing the soul than any soda or lime, or by sorrow, fear, and desire, the mightiest of all other solvents. And this sort of universal adhering power of true opinion in conformity with about real and false dangers I call and maintain to be courage. 
unless you disagree. So we see now this specific nature of courage that it's based on an opinion. It's not about understanding why, you know, that's the, the cast that has the wisdom. Those are the, they have to understand why. They have to be able to rise above everything, all these independent crafts and trades. They have to think about the whole, they have to think about all the other castes and the harmony of the city. But for these warriors who were also selected, they turned out to be maybe not so interested in beauty and the why and whatever, they, but they did have this quality that they could be trained in this absolute way. So they were given an opinion. They were given the right opinion. <laughs> you know, of course, that's a very dangerous concept. But the idea is that um, they had this type of um, good seed. And that is something that I have felt about myself, um, which also could be dangerous. But even as a child, that I was a good kid. There was always something about me kind of leaning towards the good. You know, and so maybe that wasn't even part of training. I, maybe that was the way my parents loved me. I do not know where that came from. Uh, maybe you have that. We all have some of that inside of us. There's always a part of us that speaks to the good. Okay. So taking that part of us that speaks to the good and then just really kind of like uh, making that in control, you know, and it has this opinion that, you know, it's the good that matters, right? So he's explaining that if you have this blank mind and you can prepare it properly, you know, and, and uh, cast this die indelibly, it will never go away, right? It will... Um, it will always uh, take the rightness and keep it and preserve it. So that also speaks to a couple of things I've been realizing, you know, now that I know more and more, there's this three mind uh, model uh, that that's very relevant, um, not just in philosophy, but also in psychology, in neurology. It's very real. I think it's like a bridge to scientific reality. <laughs> but um, what I seem to have been doing uh, as a high school student, tuning into Plato's Republic, maybe even before then, was um, focusing on consciousness, okay? So what do I mean by that? I mean, like, because I wanted to know absolute truth, I said, well, all of my personal experience is going to be irrelevant. I need to be able to throw that out. I need to be able to unplug the unconscious that's just kind of like offering all these ideas, just to say, no, I don't want any ideas. <laughs> I want to be in quiet. And also unplugging the conscious mind that is chattering away with this language of concepts that it's building algorithmically, all these questions that it proceeds in, you know, all these concerns that it has to say, I'm going to unplug that. And I'm only going to look for what's left, which is this very murky, abstract, um, like armless, legless, you know, it's like a computer, which all of the... Um, uh, Peripherals have been unplugged. It has no screen. It has no printer. It has no output. It has no input. It's just kind of by itself. What is it doing, right? So when I'm sitting inside myself, like my consciousness, then that is when I'm able to uh, say, hmm, but I can have an attitude. I can have a stance. I can think, oh, I am free. Or I can think, oh, I'm not free. I can make these types of distinctions, like, you know, with regard to self relation. I can be being or doing or thinking. I can be into these different modes, even though they're disconnected from reality, but that's how I can be with regard to myself. I can take my attention and give it different scopes, you know, whether it's uh, to everything, to anything, to something, to nothing. So this is what I can do. Now, maybe in order to see this, because it's like living in a glass house um, in the dark, let's say, right? I may, you know, you turn on the light, it's still invisible, like a fish to water, um, water to a fish. But a tiny bit of dust, a tiny bit of experience, you know, a tiny bit of kind of like uh, idea, like helps me to maybe see where the different uh, entryways and exit ways in these chambers are. But the point is try to make it as little as possible, as much as a kind of like mental vacuum as possible. So when he talks about this white cloth, you see this ability that we have, I think, like just to kind of go back to scratch and just to say, you know, of course, you have to train that. It's very difficult training like to do that, to be able to kind of erase that, right? That's, of course, the kind of thing a philosopher king does. That's the consciousness. But what we do for the conscious is to say, hey, uh, clear it. So we clear the, the conscious is the part that can be cleared, and then it can work in that clearing, you know, kind of like come up with new things based on based on where it's at. So... 
this distinction, and then I used to use this phrase, true opinion, false opinion. So here he does mention this in this translation, true opinion. Now, we were using a different translation, I think by Bloom. Um, but this, this one's available uh, on the public domain. Uh, so the distinction between true opinion and then what will be false opinion. Let's go to that. And so this is called temperance. I call it moderation. Temperance has to do more with you know, maybe a little bit of sobriety. Um, temperance, I replied, is the ordering or controlling of certain pleasures and desires. This is curiously enough implied in the saying of a man being his own master. And other traces of the same notion may be found in language. No doubt, he said. There is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, for the master is also the servant and the servant the master. And in all these modes of speaking, the same person is denoted. Certainly. The meaning is, I believe, that in the human soul, there is a better and also a worse principle. And when the better has the worse under control, then a man is said to be master of himself. And this is a term of praise. But when, owing to evil education or association, the better principle, which is also the smaller, is overwhelmed by the greater mass of the worse. In this case, he is blamed and is called the slave of self and unprincipled. Are not the chief elements of temperance, speaking generally, obedience to commanders, and self-control in sensual pleasures. So uh, here um, we see classically um, this um, idea of being master of your passions, you know, not being overwhelmed by your passions, not getting into fury, you know, maybe people are more controlled these days. Uh, although in different cultures, you know, it works in different ways. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I won't even say. You know, but but it's just clear. Like so, in every culture, for every person, um, for every gender, you know, we have these dynamics where, what is the control of yourself? Now, one of the interesting, beautiful things about um, math for wisdom is that we have a community with people of different points of view, and so one very popular point of view is uh, the primacy of the unconscious. That the unconscious is more powerful. The unconscious is genius. The unconscious is uh, really where we should be uh, evolving from, developing from, where we have evolved from. So um, this is pushing back. You know, I would push back. I'm not trying to shut down our community. But I'm saying that, you know, first of all, like the unconscious um, is just part of us, right? So what is the other part? And why is there another part? You see? And this is explaining, like, yes, the unconscious is, in a certain sense, more powerful, right? But that does not, and maybe, you know, it's more powerful, let's say, mentally, more powerful creatively. But that doesn't make it um, the source of uh, wisdom, let's say, uh, in the sense of um, it really maybe shouldn't be in charge. <laughs> the whole point is, how can we be in charge of ourselves? So uh, here we see that dynamics. And so how does it all come together? injustice. Uh, so you have each of these three castes have um, their own um, value, or Plato would say, let's say maybe virtue. And then there's a virtue or value of the whole thing, which is justice, uh, which is very much related to harmony. But this is harmony with regard to external world, you know, the world outside of us. That's how I would uh, think about it. And uh, maybe just to add uh, about, you know, they these different castes have different levels of knowledge. So with regard to the craftsmen, peasants, you know, he's saying they should be moderate, temperate. So that's the idea with um, sensory knowledge. You see, sensory knowledge is the knowledge of what? It is um, superficial. It doesn't tell you how things are. It tells you how things seem. Of course, it's very rich and massive knowledge. And there's a lot that maybe could be done with that. Uh, it's our window into the world. Um, but he's saying that morally uh, and just practically, we should not be dominated by, uh, you know, heightening this sensory input. Uh, a little bit goes a long way, right? And we should be on top of what we're putting into our brain or out. We shouldn't be chasing flavors and pick colors and et cetera. That's what uh, his position is. And I think that that's, uh, I'm, I guess, sympathetic. Uh, that's maybe how I relate. 
But in reality, justice was such as we were describing, being concerned, however, not with the outward man, but with the inward, which is the true self and concernment of man. For the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another, or any of them to do the work of others. He sets in order his own inner life, and is his own master, and his own law, and at peace with himself. And when he has bound together the three principles within him, which may be compared to the higher, lower, and middle notes of the scale, and the intermediate intervals, when he has bound all these together and is no longer many, but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature, then he proceeds to act, if he has to act, whether in a matter of property, or in the treatment of the body, or in some affair of politics, or private business, always thinking and calling of that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition, just and good action, and the knowledge which presides over it, wisdom. And that which at any time impairs this condition, he will call unjust action, and the opinion which presides over it, ignorance. So here he's talking about um, uh, the person, you know, who for whom the metaphor or the analogy has been the entire city. And he's saying that this person, uh, you know, who has these different tough uh, faculties or voices inside himself or herself needs to have it all in good order. The consciousness should not be bullying the unconscious, right? The unconscious should not be overwhelming all everything. The consciousness should keep that harmony between the unconscious and the conscious so that they have the proper rhythm so that they're able to say the same thing so that they're in accord. And so now he, I just have another quote where he's going back to the, um, referring back to the state as the whole. Well, then tell me, I said, whether I am right or not. You remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state, that one man should practice one thing only, the thing to which his nature was best adapted. Now justice is this principle, or a part of it. So, and he's saying, you know, like in the beginning of the book, there he's describing this thing, let's have this microscope, let's replace a person with a whole city, right? And let's build that city from scratch and see what the perfect city would look like, what the perfect person should be then. And saying, well, that there's going to be, you know, as you grow this city and see, it's very much like uh, these simulation games that we do today. You know, this is 2,500 years ago. He's pretending that there's a simulation video game and that we're going to play this, right? It just shows the power of the imagination. So, um, and you can see he relying on the unconscious, uh, he's speaking to the unconscious, he's using these beautifully vivid uh, images, right, or as John Brett would say, like metaphors, right, but to stimulate, like to kind of speak to the unconscious, like why it should not let itself uh, be the ruler, right, <laughs> so, uh, and saying, look, the conscious, like your goal is not to rule or govern, your goal is to receive and create and imagine and, you know, have this kind of bubbling life, but uh, the way you do that is if you should just be a bit under control, like you should realize, appreciate like who is supposed to be in charge, like so be obedient to your commanders and you should um, appreciate that your impulses should not be um, left unchecked, you know, so that you just become into all kinds of food and, and luxury and uh, and sensory uh, delicacies and things like that. No, just keep it simple. You know, we will value you, right? Don't don't go for these things. And he actually talks about uh, different governments, uh, like how does government become degenerate? Uh, and so he starts with this perfect thing, and then it becomes like a rule of these uh, bosses, so to speak, and then it becomes a democracy, let's say, and then it becomes a tyranny. And we see very much this... Uh, situation now where we have a democracy, it is very much subject to becoming a tyranny based on these passions that are being referred to, based on not wanting to um, care about what's true, what's not true, what's right, what's not right, uh, what's real in a in a spiritual sense, and what is just, you know, just, oh, anything goes, see, it's, it's really uh, relevant, um, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, this is version one. Uh, this is how things look like um, 
from this kind of like distant point of view, like godly point of view. We'll see in a couple of episodes, uh, version two, which is more about the human experience. And in version two, it it turns out structurally, it's going to be a lot simpler, nicer, uh, beautifuler to think about it in terms of our experience. And our experience is really about uh, that uh, like moderation, that temperance is really in a certain sense, like why uh, we have harmony, why we have justice. It's the fact that our common people in our mind, like our unconscious basically becomes trained so that our unconscious wants the right things. Our unconscious can guide us. So I think a bit of an example is like, you know, I'm I'm working on my weight, you know, I'm working to keep uh, healthy, but, then, you know, to diet, like not to be gaining weight, but preferably to be losing weight. And so, you know, I have, uh, fortunately, I live in the village, there's not a lot of food available. <laughs> And sometimes I want a treat or a snack. I'm a little bit hungry, you know, maybe hungry at the, you know, not very good times. Um, just maybe because of more stress than actually real biological, you know, physical need. So sometimes my mind, like sometimes my conscious mind will suggest, um, oh, you know, so maybe my unconscious will say, you know, I'm hungry. I'd like to eat something, right? And then my conscious mind say, oh, I'm going to have some popcorn, right? And then my unconscious mind you know, or my conscious might say, you know, could, could say, no, like, that's not the good, you should not eat, you know, wait. But then my con my consciousness, you know, I can say, like, you know, maybe these hunger ideas are not going away, maybe I should eat something. Oh, I'll have some popcorn, say, which may be not a bad food. But see, sometimes my unconscious will say, I could have a banana. I don't really like bananas. But I figure, you know, if my unconscious is telling me I could have a banana, you see, my unconscious is helping me, you see. Sometimes it's like my unconscious seems to be leading me astray, but sometimes my unconsciousness leads me in the right direction. And so when it's leading me astray, and I try to lean on the conscious, but sometimes the conscious is leading me astray. And then I try to, you know, listen for the unconscious. So the voice that's doing this kind of listening, balancing, you know, oversight, that is the consciousness. Okay, that's just a very practical way of how it works inside me. And the more I've been thinking about this three minds, uh, the more I notice that like I am three different people, really. I'm just kind of intertwined to seem to be unity. You know, because you invest in yourself. Consciousness doesn't, in a certain sense, have a self. Consciousness is almost like, a, you know, consciousness is appreciative of God beyond. Consciousness is making it so God could live through me. Or consciousness, you know, God could live within me uh, through uh, the conscious. Or God could be in our midst, you know, like a, a kind of like a, affecting the unconscious in positive ways, you know, as a good environment, you know. So uh, like bananas placed in the, you know, visible places, let's say, right? So um, that's... Um, this is about those three minds that learning to draw those distinctions within myself, you know, that I have a, you know, in a certain sense, I'm beyond a self, I have a self, the unconscious kind of like is an expression of the self, it's the, it's the self that I've invested my whole life into, right? And then I have another, like, uh, maybe it's a self, but like of ideas and concepts, etc. this whole language that I've kind of like constructed, you know, which I work with, so there's takes these different words to realize like which is which and to tease it out and to realize I'm not very that unitary, but like I'm a three, I'm a string of three braids, right? And you know, once you start to unravel it, it's interesting how it just kind of like all kind of unravels. And then it makes um it just makes the relationship with the self, I think, a little bit more um just at ease, you know, that it's it's more relaxed. Let's say, we just kind of realize, you know, that's just my unconscious. And my unconscious is just a reflection of, you know, the investment that I've been making in myself. But it can be changed. You know, it's difficult to change. The conscious is easier to change. Like I can just take an idea out and put a new idea in. And if I were, you know, of course, the unconscious kind of like has to be won over. <laughs> but once you have that, then you, you're a new person. So that's the nice thing about this theory is that uh, it allows us to undo our mistakes. Uh, live on, live freely, whether you're Plato or St. Paul or Andrus. So now this is the master diagram. We'll end here. And then in the next video, we will discuss this master diagram in full glory.
And then in another video, we'll uh, look at St. Paul's values of love, hope, faith. And then we'll look at my value system and we'll combine it all together, the different kinds of harmony as regards the meaning of life. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm learning things that I will later be able to teach people. And my skills at learning are improving and my skills at teaching are going to improve. And that's what I'm getting here with this uh, participation.